Welcome to Nonfiction Book Review Report for Human Transit by Jared Walker. The idea behind my nonfiction book review report is for me to go through the major points of the book and to criticize them and analyze them given my background. I do not have any background in transit planning or city planning, therefore I will have, will have only limited capacity to analyze or criticize in this case. Now, with, as with any book, it's my, very important who the author is. If the author is a specialist in the field, the book will be very much detailed and very specialized. But if the author is just a generalist, then there would not be much there in the book to, to, to read. Or it might serve much just like an introduction, more or less, to the topic. In this case, the author, Jared Walker, has been a consultant since 1991 on public transit projects. He, but he has education in arts and humanities, not in city planning, not in transit planning. However, he runs his own consulting company on for public transit, and from this uh, website is actually where I'm getting all this information from. Therefore, take this uh, all this information with that kind of qualification because I could not find a third party source to validate this. Now, let's talk about the book. The book is not about how great transit is. It's not one of those books that glorifies transit or goes into how much it's going to be the savior of us all, but rather tries to explain how to implement transit effectively. And it tries to explain the issues with regards to the implementing transit. The book is written as more as a promotional tool. At least it feels like that, but it doesn't really try to be all, all the time a commercial for the company or for the Jared. Or for Jared um, uh, who who is the author of this book, right? But it in that way it doesn't really take away from the content. But he does drop a few projects where he says that yes, I've worked on these projects. But he does not go on to say that my involvement was the reason this project project succeeded. Rather, he just says that he was involved in these projects and therefore he will discuss this project as an example because he has that uh, knowledge of the projects to be able to discuss them effectively. The major points of the books, book, let's look at them. The first one is a definition. It goes into the definition of public transit and says, well, the definition of public transit is uh, regular scheduled vehicle trips open to all paying passengers with a capacity to carry multiple passengers whose trips may have different origins, destination, and purposes. The reason he gives this definition is that he points out in definition-wise, a lot of things fall under the public transit besides the usual buses, streetcars, trams, uh, the subway trains or metro trains or underground trains, whatever you want to call them. He's well pointing out that any type of uh, actual trips that involve multiple passengers, so carpooling, uh, taxis, would qualify as a public transit. And he points out in the way that when we're thinking about public transit and when we're thinking about overall moving people along the roads, is that we need to think about all the different forms of uh, transportation and make sure that we coordinate with all those forms of transportation when we're designing things. It's not only you know place to move for the cars, it's not only place for the public transit, it's not place only place for the bicycles. It's it's a combined ecosystem that he he, he points out very early on in the book that she, this all has to be considered together. So what are the seven demands that are made on public transit by people? And they are well Take me where I want to go. Take me when I want to go. Be good use of my time. Be good use of my money. Provide level of safety, comfort, and amenity that's expected from the public transit. Be trustworthy. Provide freedom to change plans. Well, it's pretty much pretty simple. Take me where I, where I want to go. Is the idea is how far the public transit goes. But it's a coverage area. Take me when I want to go. Pretty much embarks on the idea of how often the, the public transit operates and from during which hours, be good use of my time. It looks at the how fast the public transit can take people from one location to another. Be good use of my money means it's a value for money proposition. Pretty much simple there, and pretty straightforward. Provide level of safety, comfort, and amenity. Again, it's very important. So if you want people to use the public transit, you need to be safe, comfortable, and find that uh, the amenities inside public transit are actually good and they can use them. Finally, be trustworthy. That means pretty much making sure that all everything about public transit functions. That uh, when people want to go somewhere, they know that the buses will be there. They'll know what time it will be there. They, they I expected to expect the price is not going to change from the one that they just saw being posted, and so on. 
Finally, provide freedom to change plans is the idea is that if you're going to destination A and you suddenly decide that you need to switch to destination B, you can do so easily. So these are the seven demands from the public transit. They are usually satisfied by the following things. Stops and stations, connectivity, frequency, span, which means time of service, speed, air, civility, reliability, simplicity, and presentation. All this factor in to answer those uh, seven demands overall. And when we're talking actually here, I should qualify what means presentation. Presentation means is how the public transit presents itself. It means the st stops and signs. It means uh, signs inside the actual buses or on the buses or any other public transit vehicle. It means how the maps are presented, the websites, all that is uh, important. Now, let's look at the next point that he makes is a and that he talks about the shape of the lines and the importance of them and one thing that he makes very straightforward is that connections are pretty much necessary in public transit yes the connections are would like to be avoided that people want to go from one point to, to another one without having to change vehicles but as far as he see that makes it very much impossible in a public transit situation happens is that reason for reason for connections is that it makes a public transit actually easier to operate now if you have a lot of those kind of direct services which are kind of intercept each other but by going through the same locations and so on he points out that makes it like makes it much more confusing because people will be arriving at the stop stations and will be seeing a huge number of uh signage say they're telling them well not huge i would say i guess a lot of signage that telling them that this bus stops here this bus stops here so they'll be wondering like which bus am i supposed to be taking to go you know to as my my the preferred destination that i'm want to go given that all this plethora of buses it's not exactly clear what if one of them is going some other direction eventually or they branch off and go on so for this reason he said he points out that connections where people just come into the hub, one hub that actually, rather than having several hubs and strung out all along because people are just, you know, all those lines are passing through all the same locations and then they're branching off. Rather, this is one location, people come in, it's much easier to kind of a point people to in the right directions. The second reason is that if you see the diagram, which I copied from his book, but he has way better diagrams in his book than Michael, my attempt to copy it, is that if we have the first one, the first diagram is you have nine destinations and you have a line going from each each destination to another destination. Now, overall, this is the one that the destination that has no connections. And then the next one next to it, which is looks like more like a snowflake, you see same nine destinations but serviced through connection by a central hub. So people wanted to go to some destinations will not be able to take a direct route, they'll have to change change routes. Difference in this case is that this diagram on the left is actually has eight lines on it. The diagram on the right has four. It's much easier to service four lines than eight in terms of costs. And so one of the reasons you need those connections is to reduce the cost. Also, if you have a limited number of buses, you're going to increase frequency if you have fewer lines. Finally, he talks about also the shape of the line and how that matters. Again, the line I, the shape of line I, which is a direct line, it's very easy for people to understand that they're going straight on one direction. No, there's no branching off into any, any, into any side streets or anything like that. It's very easy for people to understand. The shape, of, let's say if a line is shaped as a U, that creates a bit of a complication because that means it's usually what he refers to as a via route. And so you have a beginning and the, and the ending point, but then the line has to bend for some reason. It could be some kind of geographical obstacle. It could be uh, what's called an obstacle based on technology because let's say the line runs on rails and there's no rail network and the rail network is limited in such a way as that the, the tram or the streetcar has to pass through that uh, through that uh, bottom of the U in order to go from the original destination to the final destination. In this case, he points out that a lot of signage will be required to make sure that people understand what's a 
first it was original destination what's a final destination and how the line will be going through via what uh, route it will be, be going with because depending where they're getting on depending where they want to get up they'll need to be able to understand where those stops will be so the other kind of line is an s type of line and this is more of a, i guess it's for community type of a line, uh, type servicing line this is a line that bra that goes on the main streets but then goes to the side streets to service a, a larger area but as a result of that it's much harder to understand when the lines don't go straight they go they start to go around because you're not sure exactly where they are going to where they're passing through unless you have a very good map to to guide you and number two this kind of lines are much more slower than the lines like I, because the lines like I just go straight. They might they they don't service all the areas, but they just go straight through. So the final line is an O line, which is a basically a loop line. And for, he points that out again. There's a it's a it's a very similar to the I line in terms of it's very much direct. People understand it, but the issue is that. The line usually moves in one direction, and therefore not everybody would want to take uh, that kind of and use that kind of line. If they, if for them to arrive at the destination, they'll have to do most of the loop, right? So that means that the uh, the O line will might require another O line that where the loop will be going backwards, where they not backwards, but where basically there will be in the, another tra another line which will be servicing going in the opposite direction than the one on the, on the first O. So all these things uh, are very much important and the shape of the lines he points out is dependent on the beers and the chalk points that exist in the actual town or the city. And it's very much important for the town and the city to realize that and when they're designing the actual streets and streets layout to make sure that they're not, gonna, they're not catching themselves into the issue, they're not catching themselves into that, they're not kind of, let's say, let's, say they're not putting themselves in such a situations where in the future when they're designing a transit system they're going to be putting themselves in a very, a very difficult situation for the for the department by placing uh how well i'm kind of repeating myself i should actually rephrase this they're not they're not putting us in such a situation where in the future there will be extreme difficulty in making a very good public transit system because you got certain barriers or certain truck points which will require very interesting kind of a lines of service which might not be very intuitive to the users yeah that actually works much better next point stops the stops on the line the stations and the stops and the spacing of them is very much important and this is where it comes into the coverage gaps versus duplication as he points out about uh, i believe it's about 600 meters that he says um, is how is the distance that people are willing to walk to the stops or station for the public transit purposes now that means if it's not exactly a radial type of a uh, uh, distance so it's not like it's a ra radiates exactly from the stop or station Ge geography matters and barriers matter again so if the people need to walk more to get to the station even if they are in, uh, you know, in the distance of 600 meters, but if it's a walking distance, it's more than 600 meters, they might not walk that distance. They might decide not to use public transit. Therefore, it matters where you put the stations and the stops. Then if you want to include more areas, you would be interested in putting more frequent stops to reduce those coverage gaps between the stops. However, that could also lead to duplications where in those situations where a single area might be serviced by two stops which means it's not exactly optimal either because you have a more frequent stops and the frequency of the stops has an effect on speed the reason is being because let's say you be talking about bus stops the bus will have to slow down before each stop you have to stop unload the passengers load the passengers depending how the bus da does it it might be more efficient less efficient then the the fares has to be deposited the the change has to be given all that kind of a slows us down the whole transit uh, time because in transit it's not the speed of the vehicle is not the only thing that matters for the speed of the whole line it's actually the rest of it also matters and so this the frequency of stops slows down the speed of the vehicle moving on the street 
let's say this, the speed on the on the street is 60 kilometers an hour because you your vehicle has to stop more frequently, the average speed will be always below 60 kilometers an hour. So the more stops you have, the slower the line moves. The less stops you have, the faster it moves. And actually, one of the things that he points out is that people are much more willing to walk longer distances to get to the service that will take, that will have uh, less frequent stops, so the express type of service, because it will take them to their destination faster. Now we talk, we go, we talk about now frequency in the book, and uh, frequency as a major point. We already touched it down uh, before, but here it is again. The importance of frequency is such is that most people, when they think about transit, as, he, as the other point points out, they think of it from the perspective of if it's the same as a car. Like you get on the get on the on the public vehicle, transit vehicle, or you get in a car and you go to the destination. That's all that matters. So the question always is about how fast that vehicle can, is is moving in terms of uh, technological capabilities of that vehicle. But he points out that frequency matters. Let's say destination is a half an hour away, but if it takes you half an hour to wait for the for the transit vehicle to arrive, your actual travel time became an hour. So the more often this the vehicle arrives the faster is the travel time this is different from the cars because the cars that usually sit in the driveway in the garage they're they are available on demand the public vehicles are not available on demand you have to wait usually for them to arrive it's very much important that he points out that the maps and the signage needs to communicate frequency so that people understand which service operates at which frequency and when because frequency might ma might change throughout the day it will be, you know, when it comes to touch things as a peak service, right? So, this way, it's very much important. And as he points out, a lot of lines, actually, a lot of uh, maps of, uh, for the transit uh, systems do not communicate frequency. They usually communicate the coverage. But they do not show that, that yes, there might be coverage here, but, the, but there's a difference between the one line and the second line. One line if frequency is half once in half an hour, and the other line frequency is once once every five minutes. Is it, that difference is quite often not communicated on the tri uh, on the maps. His his point is that it should be communicated so that people know and they able to better service uh, better get to to the destinations or to the stations where they can actually get to the uh, to the lines that are specify a frequency that the people need so what we talked about a bit uh, about I uh, talked what the book talks about when it comes to peak service the idea that frequency changes during the actual day and he points out that well peak service uh, is, a, is a good idea because you do have usually two times during the day when people are moving in one in one of the other directions it's usually the mornings and the evenings when people are going to work or coming back to work which, which requires more buses or more other public transit vehicles to move these people that costs associated with the peak service and the first cost is labor actually point he points out that labor is actually the main cost in all the public transit uh, systems versus any other technology usually in the in the western world or the developed world the emerging the market uh, areas usually it's actually the technological side is which is more costly because the technology is less available and so buying those vehicles is, is costly while labor is much much cheaper develop uh, more in the developed world that's the other way around and labor is more expensive and the reason for cost of uh, of labor being very important in the peak service is that is the following is because you're not going to have a people working a full shift due to the peak service because they work few hours in the morning, let's say two, three hours in the morning, and then they come back and they work two, three hours uh, in the evening, which creates a split shift, not a very optimal shift. People don't like that kind of a thing. And so they need to be enticed in order to work that, the, those kind of shifts. In some cases, the enticement is done by the system itself. Sometimes it's regulated or there's a labor unions that have pushed through this. But the idea is usually is that those kind of people get compensation, such as they get paid for a certain minimum amount when they go on shifts. The idea is that you cannot go on a, let's say, two-hour shift uh, without, being, but without being guaranteed, let's say, a four hours of pay or something along those lines. 
or they get compensated for their cost of getting back and forward constantly between house and work because it's just not traveling once in the morning and once in the evening. They're constantly going back and forward to accommodate the peak service hours. All this kind of adds in. Number two, he points out that quite often this kind of a uh, peak hours, uh, the extra buses and extra vehicles and extra drivers come usually from the younger employees. And by younger, I mean not age, but the ones that came in recently into the service. Reason is because the senior employees don't like that kind of a shift and they will not take them. But the younger employees, the newer ones, will be forced to take it. In this case, you have less experienced uh, labor performing the, the more task, which is uh, more intense hours of service, which of course carries a certain amount of risk in it. And you also need to think about the fleet. That means in order to accommodate peak service, that means you need to have extra fleet available for the public transit vehicles to put them onto the lines, and then you have to take them off and you have to service them again. But that means you have a certain amount of fleet just that's just standing by for the rest of the day, not doing much except they're actually only working during the peak service. So in a, again, this adds all the cost. The next major point is speed, and we talked about it already before. And the biggest issues to speed, the three issues that he points out are the following, the traffic delay, the signal delay, and passenger stop delay. We talked about, about the passenger stop delay a bit earlier. The traffic delay, as he points out, is basically is, is a delay in traffic because the traffic is not moving fast. The buses or public transit vehicles are delayed in it. The signal delay is a signal is a delay due to the traffic lights and the stop signs that are on the road. And then of course, you know, the passenger stop delay. So the way he points out that could be dealt with the traffic delay is a dedicated uh, lines on the roads for the trial for the transit lines for the transit vehicles and as he points out this is one way to do it of course there's also the underground that kind of stuff uh, or different other technological solutions uh, but as he points out almost throughout the book is that a lot of ways uh, that uh, the solution that problems could be solved it could be they could be solved with existing vehicles you don't really need to buy a certain technology to solve a certain problem quite often you can just use it um, existing ones it's just it's how you plan out the actual transit system now when he talks about the uh, the issue of the dedicated lines on the streets for the tra for the transit vehicles he points out the issues such as the fact that people don't like the fact that the the lines are taking you know are taking away from the cars and this kind of will, will be causing congestion and, and so on further down his uh, argument is one is the following is the following. Let's say you have a four line street. Well, four lines going in one direction. If on if the public transit users constitute the one fourth of all the people moving on that on that street, then it makes sense to justify a public transit line. One of them on on that street, right? It's a one of four. You have one fourth of all the all road users using public transit. Therefore, it makes sense for them to allocate them one fourth of the road. Number two, he says, is the uh, is the criticism that is usually that the transit lines, uh, transit lanes are usually empty. He says, yes, that's exactly what it's supposed to be. Most people don't understand why you know that the transit lanes being empty is actually means that the transit is functioning properly, the lanes pro function properly, because the idea behind transit lanes is that they need to move transit vehicles faster. If the transit vehicles are standing in the transit lane, that's a problem. That means in the lane is not accomplishing the, the ability for the, not accomplishing what its goal, the ability for the transit to move through. Now, with the signal delay, the solution is that he already points out, uh, and that I already seen myself before, is the fact that sometimes there could be priority signals for for the transit vehicles, or that when the traffic vehicles arrive, the traffic lights will switch over faster. This is the type of thing that uh, reduces the signal delay. Of course, putting you know, my, from my point of view, putting something underground, of course, reduces the signal delay as well because you don't gonna have traffic signals. Well, as many traffic signals above ground as you're going to have on the ground. The passenger stop delay, he points out, well, you know, that is, you can't do much about that one, except the part where 
he talks about the electronic forms of payment, which speed up the whole process of payment on the system. Because then now you're having a bus driver receiving uh, a payment, looking to make sure it's correct, giving change if necessary. You now have a person just going and using the electronic system and just swiping into the card or touching it or all, doing something along those lines, and the payment is immediately made. So there's no delay based on that. So the next point that he talks about is density. Density is usually considered from public transit to your perspective is uh, quite often is the idea is how, how and where people live. How often, you know, how much, how many people live in certain areas, you know, there's suburbs which are much less sparse populated, there's more central areas of the east towns and cities which are heavier populated. But to his opinion, density matters more also with regards to activity-based density. That means where people actually work, where they shop, where they go to school. Because all that matters because that's going to be the destinations people will be going from other areas. Also, depending how those areas are spaced out also matters. If it's they're all spaced out, they're all intermingled, you're going to have a very different system, let's say, than if you have an industrial park in one area and you have the sleeping section of the city where, you know, where all people go back to their homes and sleep in, in another. This will be very different if those two areas, let's say, are the same people are working and, and living in pretty much the same area. So from his point, the perspective is that people need to understand when applying the, the transit, not only the density of people living, but the density of people's activities on the same map. And this, of course, also matters in certain way to the coverage versus ridership issue. In this case, the ridership means how many people are on the public transit vehicle. So when it comes to coverage, we, Quite often the goal of the uh, transit system is to have as much coverage as possible. But to him, that's a, well, that's an interesting goal. He says that goes against the idea of having a higher ridership because you might have in some areas where there's not that many people who will use the public transit, so you're going to have your public transit vehicles running empty. So to him, what matters is to make sure that the ridership is also there, right? So. Because those are the two goals that are setting against each other, and through the throughout the book, he does talk about the idea that you cannot get everything, right? It's not the, it's the idea is that you cannot have a you your cake, your cake and eat it at the same time. You you do have to make choices. You have to prioritize what's your what's your choice. He also points out that there would be areas that should not be uh, uh, basically serviced by public transit because they're just too far. Or they, or they don't have enough people living there to justify it. And people need to understand that if they're going to move to certain areas, they might not have public transit because those areas are not built, let's say, for public transit, or they not, do not have any, or it's not going to be optimal for public transit to reach there. It also comes back to sometimes what he talks later on in the books. Uh, his book is the idea that the urban planning, the city planning, has to be made in, in, a, in mind that you're gonna have to have public transit in the future. So you have to make sure you planned out the area accordingly. Now, the final point of the book is, is the fares, and he talks about the, how much the public transit should charge. Well, he points out that quite often the public transit is, is subsidized by the government, so the fares are usually low, however, the the, the cost of the fares would, of course, fluctuate with the subsidies. Now, then he also talks about the idea of free fares, and he actually says that it's not that such a great idea quite often. The reason is being that the free fares might make the transit look like it's a form of a transportation only for the poor. That's the case. You're going to have a, other demographics kind of jumping off from the public transit. Therefore, your ridership will decline, and the perception of a public transit will decline. If you want a higher ridership, you should not really make it look like it's something that only a small, a smaller demographic is only, is able to take. So free fares, as he sees, actually is not the best solution for public transit. Plus, you know, if you think about it, the free fares is what actually covers the costs. Finally, he talks about time and distance-based fares, and the idea behind time and distance-based fares 
is that again you have uh depending how long you're taking the transit or how far you're going the fare will be changing his issue is that you have to make sure that the fare system is a is easily understood by people who use it so you not, should not be wondering what would be the cost of them going from destination from point a to the to their destination at point b they should be able, able to easily know what it is and his solution to that is he points out again is electronic based payment which will number one deduct exactly the amount of money that people need to need to pay for that kind of uh, distance uh, or times that they're traveling and he also points out that the system should be able to communicate ahead of time to people to tell them this is how much your trip will cost so they can use that to judge what the trip uh, what the, whether they should take the trip or not and how they should uh, plan the trip so in my conclusion this is a very easy to read book i did not find it very difficult to read it's very straightforward he explains things really well it, it's a good book for introduction to the transit and transit planning as mentioned before it also serves a bit of a promotional role in a way so he's not gonna go into every single detail here in the book or but he does bring out a lot of good questions and a lot of uh, uh, good interesting points about the transit and the transit planning and the issues around it that kind of make it make a person understand better the whole situation right thank you for listening with a nonfiction book review report